We're going to read God's word here. If you could get to Revelations chapter 16, verse 15. So I welcome all those that are in person. And I greet those that are at home, New Life at Home. We welcome you. We greet you. We're glad that you're tuning in. Revelations chapter 16. We're on a sermon series that is called, I Do. Today I want to speak to you about the night. What is it about night? Out of Jesus' mouth, this is what he says. 16 verse 15 behold I am coming like a thief lest is the one who stays awake keeping his garments on I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them keep your clothes on keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed I want you to go ahead and repeat after me your word is written in my mind your word is hidden in my heart your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path I will seek you with all my strength I choose to live my life according to your word your word O Lord is eternal you may be seated So I need to give you a quick recap of the last two weeks so that you can understand today's sermon. The first week we talked about the ring. In modern days, in a, in a, a person who gets engaged or proposes would offer a ring. And if the woman would take the ring, it is a sign that they said yes. Well, in the Bible times, there is a specific area, land, that we've been speaking about, which is in northern Israel. Uh, This is what we call the Galileans. Jesus was a Galilean. The disciples were a Galilean. And they had their own ways and they had their own tradition. So the way that they did their engagement was that the groom would go before the bride and offer the cup. And it is said that if the bride accepts it, she would then drink the cup and she would give it to the groom. And the groom would then drink it and they would then come into an agreement that they are now engaged, about to get married. But following that step, we learn that now the man, the groom, goes out and he prepares a place. He prepares a place because following the ceremony, there will be a great feast. And then you have the woman who's going to go out and she is going to buy the cloth so that she can prepare her wedding dress. It is all about the preparation. You see, what you need to know is that they couldn't go to one space because the cloth that they needed was in various places. So it took time. It it took effort. It it took their skill to be able to gather and collect this cloth so that they can customize a dress. And now we know tonight or today we're going to talk about the night. What is the value in the night? Nobody knew the Um, The hour, except the father, not the groom or the bride, knew the hour that this event was going to happen. Now, what they did know was the season. At the right season, the bride and bridesmaid, watch this now, sleep in their garments. Think about that for a moment, that every single night that the bride was sleep in her wedding dress. Every single night she was sleeping in her dress waiting for the groom to come so that she can be prepared. And the other thing that she would do is that she would keep the lantern on. So as she kept the lantern on, every day, every night, clothing was on, lantern was on. It was a sign of preparation. It was a sign that I am ready, and when the groom comes, I will be prepared. Now, the groom is released by the father to come for the bride in the middle of the night. So the groom is also clothed. The groom is also sleeping with its tucks at night, waiting 
for the father to come in and say, son, it is now time to go get your bride. It was in the middle of the night that that would happen. So the bride knows the groom is coming because a trumpet is blown. And the sound awakens the bride to let her know that the time is now. Now this is parallel to Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 where it says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there was a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So coming in the middle of the night declares that it could happen when no one else knows about it. When the sound of the trumpet is heard, that every person who is in covenant relationship, every person who is awaiting knows it is the hour. It is the moment. This is exciting for us who understand that Jesus Christ is coming back soon. The Bible teaches us that there will be a trumpet and at the sound of a trumpet is when we will be raptured. At the sound of the trumpet is when every person who's in a covenant relationship with God will be reunited with him. It is at the sound of that trumpet that you and I are waiting for. But I want you to know on the other side of it, though we are excited, we are also burdened. And the reason that we are burdened is because there are many people, some whom we love, some whom we know personally, that don't know Jesus. That we are desiring, that we are praying, that they would come into relationship with Him. So on one side, we are excited because we can't wait to meet the King. But on the other side, we are burdened to pray for those that don't have a relationship with Christ. I want to encourage everyone here today to spiritually stay awake. That there are many Christians, there are many people that have fallen asleep. According to the National Sleep Foundation, about half of U.S. adult drivers admit to consistently getting behind the wheel while feeling drowsy. About 20% admit to falling asleep behind the wheel at some point in the past year. With more than 40% admitting that this has happened at least once in their driving careers. Now, I'm not going to ask you, have you ever fallen asleep behind the wheel? But let me tell you a personal story. Now, I was a youth pastor at one point in my life. And as a youth pastor, we used to throw these lock-ins. These lock-ins were from hell. And pretty much what it was is that you will be locked in, we'll, we'll rent a sports complex, and all night we'll, we'll be up and we'll be messing around and having fun, and, and, and we will do that to the sunrise. So if we started at 7, we'll go to about 6 o'clock. Now here's the thing. Uh, you tell parents to pick up your kids at 6, they won't be rolling in to about 7, 7.30. So you know that as the pastor, you're the last one that is closing up, making sure all the kids are in the right hands, and then you make your way home. So one night or one day, one morning after a lock-in, I'm driving in my car and I'm riding through a small street. Well, I find myself on a red light. So you know what I told myself? Let me just shut the eyes for a few seconds. I shut my eyes for a few seconds as I'm in the red light. And I don't know how long my eyes were shut. Have you ever um, felt like, you, you took a nap, right? Because, you know, you probably slept for a few hours, but it felt like a few minutes, right? So I don't know how long I was behind the wheel with my eyes closed, but here's what I heard. I heard the trumpet. No, I heard a horn that was beeping behind me that woke me up. I first thought that Jesus was coming. I was like, take me, Lord! Until I realized it was just a horn. A person who was telling me to get up. The light is green. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, every year about 100,000 police reported crashes involve drowsy driving. These crashes result in more than 1,550 fatalities and 71,000 injuries. Falling asleep can cause a major crash. 
People who fall asleep at the wheel, they start by being awake. In the drive, they fell asleep. They didn't make their destination yet. And in the journey, they crashed. And in many cases, it became fail. How many people have fallen asleep spiritually while they're on the wheel? We don't even know the, the fatalities and the casualties that we are causing in our lives and the people that are connected with us because we have fallen asleep spiritually. While many people have fallen asleep spiritually, we must remain awake. To remain means to continue or carry on. And as Christians, there are some fundamentals that are built on that are necessary to maintain. It's necessary to maintain and to remain a consistent habit. It is necessary to remain and continue doing things that have gotten you this far. See, a car can't keep running without gas. A body can't keep living without water. A soul can't grow in holiness unless it remains. You want to grow in holiness, which should be all of our desire to grow in holiness. Holiness means separated. God is trying to separate the good from the bad. If you want to be holy, then you have got to understand that you have got to stay awake. I mean, God tells us to be holy for I am holy. So as a believer, I want to be growing and consistently thriving in holiness. There was a church in Revelation chapter 2, the church of Ephesus, who was rebuked because they spiritually fell asleep. If you read the first few verses, you will see that God is encouraging them and applauding them and praising them for their good works. He was telling them that, man, you guys, you guys got a good system in your church. He said, man, you guys got good work habits and work ethics in your church. Keep on with your hard work. But and then the, 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 the conversation began to shift. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, and this is what he says. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. you got to know he's talking to church folks. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. In other words, hey, don't forget the place that I've picked you up from. Don't forget the valley that you were in. And when you called out my name and I came and I rescued you from that valley. Don't forget from that place that you were in that you begin to now have a sense of joy. Don't, don't forget that. Remember where you have fallen. And then he says, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless... You, replay, you repent. He says, I will come to you. The lampstand that you have, the light that is shining, the light that is resonating, the light that is radiant, I'm going to come and I'm going to remove it from you. It wasn't because they were lazy. It wasn't because they lacked work ethic that they were rebuked. Listen to me. They had all the right doctrine, wrong heart. I'll say that one more time. They had all the right doctrine, wrong heart. They lost sight in remaining spiritually awake. How many people, starting with ourselves, do we know that fell asleep? Fell asleep spiritually. Don't praise God the way that they used to praise. Don't worship the way they used to worship. Don't live for God the way that they used to live for God. What mattered to them when it came to the things of God no longer takes priority over their life. Little by little, they are drowsy. Little by little, they're falling away. Little by little, they're falling asleep. When you forsake, you abandon when it doesn't matter to you no more, when it doesn't get prior. You know what? Because if it matters to you, you will prioritize it. 
I'm going to say that one more time. If it matters to you, you will prioritize it. So let me put it in this term. If God matters to you, then you would prioritize God. When you forsake, you abandon. You know what the church of Ephesus did? They had replaced works for intimacy. They did all the work, but they lost their intimacy. They abandoned their passion and their pursuit for God. Have you abandoned your pursuit for God? Have you lost your passion and your drive and your zeal for God? See, the church did not remain because they had forsaken their first love. They did what they felt they needed to do. But in the process of all of that, they forgot why and who they were doing it for. I serve in ministry. I serve as a pastor. I, why do I do it? I serve because I do it for him. I serve because I love him. You need to understand this. I do what I do because I love him. I make sacrifice because I love him. What you do is you make sacrifices because you love what you're sacrificing for. This church did not remain because they had forsaken their first love. See, I want to inspire. I want to encourage. I want to provoke somebody that is listening to my voice. That possibly you have fallen away. Or possibly your light is dimming. I want to tell you today. Do not forsake your first love. So there's three things I want to quickly give you. Remain spiritually awake by being devoted to God. Devote yourself to God. Commit to God. Live for God. The church of Ephesus worked the ministry as a system. They worked it as a habit. It became a religion. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity, it's a relationship. Let me break it down a little bit more. You don't call your marriage a religion. I don't call my marriage a religion. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. Jesus is our groom and we are his bride. That's more than a systematic practice. It's a relationship. The thing about relationship is that it is a two-way street. Religion is one way. I tell you what to do and you do it and you have no voice. Relationship is interacting. Listen, a relationship is a conversation. When I communicate, I can communicate with God and he will communicate with me. And I know some folk will say, Pastor D, I never hear God's word out loud. Hey, listen, open up your Bible and read it out loud and then you can hear the voice of God coming out loud to you. That is the audible voice that you've been waiting for. If it's not a one, if it's not a two-way relationship or two-way um, communication, then it's just a monologue or it's just a dialogue. I want to make sure that I am not stuck in a religion, but it is a relationship. It is about intimacy. It is about love. It is about trust. It is about communion. It's about relationship. So number two, remain spiritually awake by having a heart of repentance. So don't only be devoted to God. Don't just prioritize God, but also have a heart of repentance. Some of us need a spiritual awakening, and that can't happen unless we repent. The antidote in forsaking your first love is by repenting and doing the work you did at first. This is the advice that God gave the church of Ephesus. Repent and do the work you did at first. In other words, go back to the fundamentals. Go back to why you fell in love. Go back to the basics. What was it that got you there? What was it that you did that built your faith? Go back to that. Don't leave that. Don't forsaken that. Don't abandon that. But use that so that you can build upon what you're building on. If you don't remain in Christ, you're going to find yourself in a dark place. Your works will be a performance and God will not be in it. Everything you would do is a performance. Even though you're trying your very best, if God is not in it, it's not worth it. 
the, the lampstand, which is the light, the Bible says, will be removed. Jesus is the light. So when Jesus says he will remove the lampstand, listen to me, he will remove his presence from it. The last thing that you and I want is for him to remove his presence from us. What I need you to understand something, God says that I am omnipresent. He would always be present, but will you allow his presence to be in you? See, some folks get that mixed up. He would always be there, but will you allow his presence to be in you? He would always be before you, but will you allow his presence to be in you? Would you set the atmosphere of the space that you occupy and let the presence of God be there? He is present, but is this presence in you? As a church, we are a witness to reflect the light. Jesus is the light, the last thing we want. It's to have his presence removed. See, not only is, is, is the, the light for guidance, because the Bible does teach us that his word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a guidance for my life. It is my guidance. It is my instructions. If I'm confused, I got to go to the word. If I'm second guessing, let me go to the word. If I don't know what to do, I'm going to do what God asked me to do. Be still and know that he's God. The greatest advice you can ever have is the word of God. It is alive. It is active. The word is a double-edged sword. No matter how and where, it can be a blessing to you. You want the presence of God to be in you. The presence of God being removed from you could be damaging. The other fact of the light of God is this. You want his blessing. Everything you touch, you want God's blessing. I'm going to say that one more time. Everything you touch, you want God's blessing. When you touch your children, you want the blessing of God upon them. When you touch your workplace, you want the blessing of God. When you touch your bank account, you want the blessing of God. When you touch their vehicle, you want the blessing of God. I want the blessing of God to be on my life. As a church, it is our responsibility to reflect His presence. To reflect, reflect his blessing. So when the lampstand is removed, we are no longer reflecting that light. We, we have a lampstand with no light. What good does a lampstand serve in its purpose if it has no light? We are no longer remaining in the light. And if we are not in the light, we're in the dark. If we're not in the light, we're in the dark. It's either one or the other. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. This light cannot be hidden. The reality is, is that the light is on. It would always, always invade darkness. But darkness cannot invade darkness because darkness will always be in darkness. But the moment that the light is in darkness, then now what you have is light exposing darkness. We are no longer to be stagnant and not remaining. We ought to remain in the presence of God so that God can be reflected. Repentance is what keeps the light on. It's what keeps us, it's what keeps us, it's what protects us, it's what heals us. Repentance is the spiritual awakening for anyone who has fallen asleep. Repentance is not just for the unsaved. Repentance is for everyone. I believe that it is the antidote in which we, you and I, it is the medication, it is the prescription in which you and I should use on a daily basis. Repentance is not about second chances. Because you've lost that second chance a long time ago. It's not about second chances. You've already used that card out. That get out of jail card has already been used up. You know what repentance is? Repentance is about another chance and another chance and another chance. That every time you repent, the grace of God is given and another chance, another chance, another chance happens. So you got to be patient. Be patient with God. You got to be patient with yourself. See, patience is the very first attribute in scripture that is mentioned among the other fruit of the Spirit.
the very first. Patience is a virtue. And as we wait, patience keeps us from falling asleep. Now, I need you to understand this. Spiritually speaking, patience does not mean going to sleep. Patience does not mean to stop. Remain as you wait. Build as you wait. Develop as you wait. Rest as you wait. Prepare as you wait. But don't be foolish and fall asleep. There is purpose in your wait. There is purpose in your patience. Jesus Christ is coming back. And I know what some of you are saying. Pastor D, I've heard that a thousand times. I know. I grew up in church. I've heard sermons about this many times. But there are two scriptures that I want to point out to you to make you understand that though we heard it a thousand times, it may not be as you think. Scripture teaches in Psalms chapter 90, you can also read in 2 Peter chapter 3, where the Bible talks about that a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day when it comes to God. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So if you go with the scientific, the Christian scientific graph that says that we have been in existence, the world has been in existence from anywhere from six to 10,000 years. Now I know the secular um, scientists would tell you four billion years, but just work with me here for a moment. If we have been in existence, let's just say 10,000 years, for all of you math people, 10,000 years, if a thousand years is one day and one day is a thousand years, are you telling me that God is saying that we've only been around for 10 days? That we've been, been waiting according to God's calendar for 10 days? I want you to understand something here today, that the waiting is on us. And when it comes to God, God is not being impatient because time is not behind him and time is not before him and he is not managed by time itself. He is time. He dictates time. You've got to recognize the God that we serve always was. Think about that. He always existed. Who created God? He always existed. He always was. Time was not created for him. He's infinity and beyond. Infinity doesn't even exist when it comes to God because infinity is infinity. infinity. I remember Toy Story. Remember Toy Story? Infinity and beyond. The God that we serve is infinity and even before infinity was created, God was there. He always was, he is, and he always will be. Think about that. So when it comes to God, God is not managed by time. You've been, you've been alive for whatever years you, you've been alive. I mean, look at that for a moment. God has been around. I can't even use the word forever because forever doesn't even describe the timetable in which God has been alive. That's mind-blowing. So don't fall asleep, but remain. Lastly, number three, remain spiritually awake by having enough oil. Be devoted to God. Have a heart of repentance and make sure you have enough oil. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Jesus is telling a parable. A parable is a heavenly meaning with earthly story. Now, when Jesus told parables, he shared these stories, these earthly stories in context so that people that is listening to what he's saying can understand. And this is what he says. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Five took no oil with them. But the wise took flask. You know what a flask is? It's like a container. It's an overflow of oil. Five virgins took extra oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. They all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, I want you to say midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. 
Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lambs. They were getting the rams ready. And guess what? And the foolish said to the wise, Hey, give us some of your oil. For our lambs are going out. But the wise answered saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, you go rather to the dealer and buy for yourself. Do you know how many times people are so dependent on other people's oil? Do you know what it is? Like you're constantly waiting for another human being when you yourself can have the oil? I get it. I get it. Sometimes you need that pastor. I got it. I got it. We're with you. But what I'm trying to tell you is that my resource is your resource. Are you hear what I'm saying? What my access is your access. God is no respecter of man. My God is your God. But the wise answer saying, since there will be not enough for us and for you, gather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the foolish, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. They went in. The wise went in. They, they are celebrating because the groom has arrived. The Bible says the door was shut. Afterwards, I want you to say afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, this is the hardest word you would ever hear in the face of this planet. This is probably the most disappointing, harsh, sad words but he answered truly I say to you Jesus says I do not know you and then he goes back from telling the story he gets away from the story and now he's talking to everybody and he tells New Life Covenant today watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour in other words, he's giving you an opportunity to say, are you going to be like the five wise? Or are you going to be like the five foolish? I want you to know that all ten started with the same resource. All ten had access to the Savior. All ten faced struggles. All ten needed to go and buy supplies. But five were prepared, and the other five were unprepared. I started to think about this for a moment, because five and five is 10. Five is half of 10, that's 50%. I thought about my re marriage relationship with my wife. My wife and I, two people, half of us is 50%. In other words, there is a split that one person entered the kingdom of heaven, while the other did not enter the kingdom of heaven. I want you to think about for a moment as you look around or you see the um, views that are online right now. I want you to split that in half. That according to this parable, not that this is factual, but if we take the words from this parable and begin to put some perspective on it and say, wow, only 50% would make it to heaven and the others won't. 50%. You want to make it more personal? Split your family in half. That if you're a family of six, that half your children will go to heaven and the other half will not go. How devastating does that feel? I don't know about you, but we are living in time where the gospel of Jesus Christ has to be shiny, greater. And it has to be shining now. And God is trying to tell you today, do not remain in darkness, but I am the light and I am the word salt of the earth. And if you just come to me, then I'll give you the light that you need. As you wait for the group, you're going to need oil. Oil is symbolic. It is a symbol of our faith and it is used for dedication and blessing. 
anointing means to consecrate. And the oil was the tool used to anoint. So when you read scriptures, the priests, when they were anointed, consecrated, called, they were anointed with oil on their forehead. When they dedicated a temple like this temple, they would sprinkle oil as they consecrated, as they sanctified the place and they made it holy. The fact that you and I have an opportunity today to have oil, what that means is that there is a separation from good and bad. What that means is that I'm going to sanctify myself for such a time as this. What it means is that I may be more greasier than the person that next to me. But as long as I'm greasy because I have oil, then baby, slide all over me. When Jesus says he is coming like a thief, he doesn't mean he is coming to steal nor rob anyone from anything. He did the total opposite. He is coming like a thief in the night because a thief controls the narrative of when it would happen. Thieves don't only steal at night, but Jesus was very intentional because Jesus knew they understood it was at night that guards stay up and they hold their post. Jesus also understood that any person that was naked in public, it meant most times that they were becoming slaves and stripped and possibly crucified. So nakedness meant something to the Jews, to the Galileans. So when the bride laid in her dress all night, Jesus was saying as we remain clothed, remain covered, remain prepared. Because if you're laying down naked, why, why was that significant? Because it was very hot and most people will sleep naked. And he's saying, don't be like those that are sleeping naked because when they try to come, like the five foolish people that went to go buy oil when they should have had oil, came back and it was too late. People who are naked are going to run out. Run out naked. And God is saying, you can run out in your dress. You can run out in your tux. You can be prepared. So New Life Covenant, be devoted to God. Have a heart of repentance. And make sure, not only do you have oil in your lamp, but make sure that you have overflow. I want you to stand to your feet overflow overflow for your children come on now overflow for your family overflow for your business come on overflow for your community overflow don't be satisfied with the status quo but God wants you to have overflow don't be content because you have some I want you to go after God. I want you to be devoted to God. And I want the cup to be overflowed. That there is a river that is flowing out of your cup. You're in this room today and those that are watching online. And you're saying, Pastor, I haven't been devoted. Pastor, I haven't repented. Pastor, I need the oil. This altar, this call is for you. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. If that is you, lift up your hands. We want to pray with you. I want to be devoted. I need to repent. I need oil. Oil for my family. Oil for my ministry. Oil for my purpose. Oil for my life. I need oil. Those of you who are online, come on, put it in the comment section. Whatever you need, we got people praying for you. Free worship is going to lead us. Get out of your seats. Meet me at this altar. Do it quickly. Do it quickly. And I'll provide the sacrifice. You provide the spirit. Come on, I need oil. I will open up inside. Fill me. Come on, I need oil. I need oil to parent my children. Come on, I need oil to be effective. I need 
oil to guide those that are underneath me. I need oil for my ministry. I need oil over my life. I need oil in my household. I need oil in my community. I need oil. I need an overflow. You provide the fire. prayer today I need you to lift up your hands all over where you're at and I need you to begin to open your mouth and I need you to tell God God fill me up flow of God I want the favor of God I want the blessing of God come on I need you to begin to pray over your hands right now that everything you touch would be blessed come on that the next time you touch your children that they will be blessed and anything that you touch will turn to gold I need you to begin to lift up a prayer to God that the next time you pray for somebody that they would be uh, they would know Jesus Christ that they would be in place where their hearts will be open to him let God use you let God anoint you let God call you for such a time that the overflow will be for others that have no oil that the overflow will be for others overflow may not be for you overflow may be for someone else Father, we thank you, we praise you, we magnify you. You are a good God. In the last 60 seconds, I want God right now to pour his blessing upon you. If you're in your home, I want God to pour his blessing on you. That the Spirit of God would rest upon you. I pray that God would anoint you. I pray that God would elevate you. God is present, but is His presence in you? I pray that God would open doors in your life. I pray that you would connect with the right people. I pray that God would surround you with the right people. People that are not just trying to take from you, but people that are trying to give to you. I pray oil over your life. I pray favor over your life. I pray the presence of God over your life. I close it with this. When God looked upon Saul because of its disobedience, he told Saul, 
who at one point was anointed by God and he told them my presence is no longer with you I want to let you know here today that you may hold the position but what good is the position without the anointing and God told so so because you decided to leave me and forsake me I'm about to look for the new king of Israel that's where he found David he found someone that everyone else overlooked but the simple fact that his heart was positioned for God God looked not at the outer experience but he looked at the internal and he said David I anoint you as the next king of Israel David became one of the greatest kings known in the Bible one of the greatest warriors God used David why not because of his physical gift he used David because he was a man of God's own heart when he needed to repent he repented and he turned over his life to Jesus what I want to commission you today is when you walk out of these doors know that 